Welcome to another edition of RCE. You can find us online with our entire back catalog at rce-cast.com. Also, be sure to hop over to iTunes and leave us a review. Reviews raise our visibility on iTunes and gets the word out more of what, what we're doing. Um, also, I have again here Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. No problem. Cool. So today... We have uh, a project that's a little different than what we've done before, but definitely related to the high-performance computing because it deals with basically the inputs and the outputs of what we deal with. Right. So here we're going to learn about reproducibility, data transport, publishing data, sharing data. Um, this, this is pretty exciting. So um, we have Joseph. Joseph, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Ah, oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, so my name is Joseph Paul Cohen. I'm the founder of Academic Torrance, the, the founder and director of the Institute for Reproducible Research, uh, and a deep learning researcher um, when I'm not working on this stuff. So, Joseph, today, uh, what institution are you affiliated with? Uh, I am, I'm beginning a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Montreal in the Milo Lab with Yasha Bengio. So, what is Academic Torrance? All right, so in... At the, the big picture, I guess, it's, it's a legal infrastructure for academics to use BitTorrent. Um, also comes with a suite of kind of tools uh, that kind of make the tracker easier to use, uh, some code to help uh, work with it. Um, and it's also an index of data sets and other academic materials. Uh, it's kind of a uh, one repo you can check for that data set you're looking for. Um, and then as a, as a project, we offer free technical support to people that are using um, the, the project, uh, and also there's a community that surrounds it versus, uh, built, that's built up of a donated storage and bandwidth uh, that kind of uh, um, flows around all the data sets that are, that are there to make sure what's, what's in demand is all over the world, distributed globally. Okay, so give us the 30-second description, right? For those of our listeners who aren't necessarily familiar with what is a torrent, right, and, and how is this different? All right, so normally when you download a file, uh, you click a link and you download it directly from a single server uh, where the data resides. Uh, with a torrent, um, you download a skeleton of the file, which is known as the .torrent file. And the skeleton gives you hashes. It's just the hashes of the actual data. So you can have all the hashes of a terabyte of data stored in, in one or two megabytes. So why do we care about those hashes? Well, so then you can ask anyone in the world for data, and they'll send you their version of that data, or, or, you know, the, their pieces that they have of that, uh, and you can verify that the pieces people sent you are actually from the original file, just because you would compare it to the skeleton, right? So now you know that if someone sends you data, and you don't have to tr know them or trust them, uh, you, you have the actual authoritative data, right, that was meant to be sent to you, right? Uh, so that allows you to ask uh, the world to send you this data and you can have, you can have 40 uh, to 4,000 people sending you pieces of this gigantic piece of data and you can verify that each one is authentic and then build that into the original file. Uh, and this, this ends up being much faster uh, than downloading it from a single source, uh, which, is, which is great for a few reasons because the data gets corrupted. So if it gets corrupted on the single source, then you have to go to a backup. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, for for someone to kind of find a new URL of a file that they trust, uh, but if you're downloading a torrent, you, you have the you have the hashes, so you just trust the hashes. That's all you have to. It's all you have to trust. Uh, wherever the data sits net today, you don't have to trust them, but you can verify that the uh, the actual data that's there is the real data that you were looking for, and the real data that um, was that you were meant to download. Right? Okay, so these hashes and the fact that hashes each represent a chunk of the data and we would expect no hash collisions, that's what guarantees that the piece I'm getting from user B, which is this is all happening transparently, is actually the data and they've not been able to modify it and run one past me. I, I know it's the original copy. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So if, uh, if, if you receive some, some bad data or some data that was corrupt in transit, uh, it would your your client would automatically get that data, 
like compute the hash on top of it and say, oh, that's, that's bad data uh, or that's the correct data. So this also happens to be a benefit when you have data at rest sitting on your, you know, your storage arrays, your NASs, your, your SANs. Uh, if you have you know, four terabytes of data, the probability that one of those bits is going to flip or, or, or that some piece of it's going to be corrupted just goes up, right? So because you have this torrent file which has these hashes, you can actually verify that the data on your own machine is the same one that you originally downloaded. Uh, and if not, um, with the torrent infrastructure, you can just download that one piece that got corrupted. Uh, so it kind of uh, um, from people sending you data, you can verify that it's correct. And then from your own data sitting on disk, you can verify that it's correct. So if we're moving all this data around, doesn't that mean that if I down the people who I'm getting these chunks from, they have to be running some sort of server or something? Uh, so we, we actually work um, with, with two, kind of two different paradigms of BitTorrent. So there's the basic BitTorrent protocol, which, yes, you need a BitTorrent client uh, to be hosting this data, right, to, to host it over the BitTorrent protocol. Um, we also encourage and work with people uh, to use this concept of an HTTP seed, which we kind of, we, with our GUI on the site, we integrate that nicely so you can uh, um, kind of manage your, the data that you're trying to host. Uh, but this, these HTTP seeds, uh, they actually will reside on a, on a regular HTTP server. So maybe your uh, computer science department web server, you can put your data on there or any web server. And then you can have that as one of the sources of data. Uh, so we kind of uh, merge those together uh, using parts of the BitTorrent specification uh, to make sure that your, down, your, your data is, uh, is able to be downloaded from anywhere. Right? So if someone's downloading... Uh, data from some location and there are no BitTorrent peers around, uh, then that person will simply just download from that HTTP server where it was originally. Uh, but as uh, as more people start downloading, um, it kind of builds up that peer-to-peer -peer BitTorrent protocol and that allows a, a kind of a scalable uh, way to distribute this data uh, while, while relying on both HTTP web servers and BitTorrent clients. No, I want to jump back a little bit. You also mentioned that there was a legal framework aspect to this. Um, can you describe that? Uh, well, so basically, we're, we're, uh, uh, there's, uh, this is purely for hosting data legally, right? So uh, in the, I've seen other people you know, before this, which is one of the motivations, right? Put like, data that someone needed to transmit uh, and put it on some, use some kind of a, a pirate infrastructure, or they put it on, um, some system that's, you know, this data set is right next to a movie, right? Which, you know, there's some issues with that movie being, you know, people have a lot of concerns with those movies being, uh, being on the same sites as their data, right? So this, this way, uh, you can go to your boss and say, you know, we're going to put this data on academic torrents. Uh, and then we, we stipulate everything on the site is legal to share, right? And it's specifically designed to, uh, to aid researchers, right? So uh, kind of, uh, makes it easier to use this data. It's kind of a um, uh, a protection, if you will, uh, for dealing with your your uh, your bosses or the other researchers you're working with. You don't have to go to the IT department and justify why you need access to the Pirate Bay to download the you know ImageNet uh, because it's you know it's really big. So here you can you know Academic Torrents provides that uh, with kind of um, the uh, clean image uh, that everything is, is, uh, is legal and your, your IT department doesn't need to freak out that uh, all their HPC servers are contacting the Pirate Bay or some other BitTorrent index you know, tracker. Uh, so by having a fully kind of legal infrastructure, uh, it makes it easier for people to adopt this, 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 uh, bit, this protocol and, and you, you know, reap the benefits of it uh, without having to deal with um, any of the neg negative aspects. So that kind of leads into what types of data do you distribute via academic torrents? All right. So uh, we, we have, we still had two categories for a very long time. We just added a third one. Uh, there's papers, uh, data sets, and courses now. Uh, so uh, data sets were a huge uh, kind of win. Like people love using this for data sets. They're all, almost all the traffic is from data sets. Um, papers uh, was kind of an original direction. Uh, and there are papers there, but um, it seems uh, people aren't 
you know, so far adopting this for, for papers uh, uh, too much. I mean, there are some papers, but, um, and then also courses. Uh, so video courses. So if you're um, going to be on a flight and you'd like to download uh, all the open courseware video about physics, right? You can, you can do that and then you can get on the plane and you have all these files offline uh, and you, you have them you know, stored there, right? So uh, for people who prefer not to stream these videos, even though they're already kind of available freely online, um, people would much prefer to, to download them. Uh, and so, so data sets and courses have been, have been pretty popular, uh, especially when they get big. So when, when you have big data sets like ImageNet, right? so it's uh, 150 gigabytes, uh, it's, it takes forever uh, if you just download it over HTTP directly. Um, so using a peer-to-peer -peer model uh, speeds that up, and that's, that's a benefit for, for downloading this. Be so because uh, you can have a fast connection, uh, and then you can, you can download this from multiple peers at once, uh, and that's kind of the, the allure of, of downloading large data sets through the system. Uh, there's also other data sets that, that are really popular, like the Netflix data set that doesn't seem to have a home anywhere else. It's not on any academic websites anywhere, um, but it is on academic torrents and people are downloading it. Um, largely, I think a lot of the data sets people want uh, are related to deep learning. So there are a lot of images, image data sets, uh, whether it's the tiny images data set, which is like 400 gigabytes, um, uh, or uh, CIFAR, 10, 100, all the, all the kind of seminal data sets that are used and tons of papers are, are, on, this, uh, are on this platform uh, and people are downloading them. So what, you gave some examples of data sets. Like what are some of your most popular and uh, I looked around the site a little bit or most notorious data sets that you were hosting on there? Uh, so one of the most notable ones that I find uh, useful is, uh, is a, a virtual machine image for a course that's actually a... Uh, um, run at, at UMass Boston. Uh, so the professor distributes their virtual machine image through, through BitTorrent. Uh, and they actually told me, um, when, when, so I, I knew this professor and, and uh, he knew that I was working on academic torrents. And he said, I was trying to distribute this VM for my website. Uh, and he just sent out the HTTP link. Uh, and he said, almost all my students emailed me back and said, why don't you host this as a torrent? It's taking so long to download. Uh, so that was kind of a, a nice a personal story. And then for the past you know, few semesters now, uh, he's been distributing this, this VM. Uh, um, and it's, you know, it's a three gigabyte VM. Uh, every semester, uh, students will download it like maybe once uh, or twice, right? So I'll make it um, 300 downloads per, per VM uh, per, per semester. Uh, so this, this immensely helps the students. And you can kind of, you can kind of watch when the course begins, that, that torrent will, specific, will spike so the most popular thing at that moment kind of gets a, uh, a buzz uh, of how many people that are downloading it. Um, so that's a, that's a very notable um, file. Um, so this is obviously working well for data sets and things like that. Do you do any curation? Like, are you, do you have people approving data sets being added or is this kind of like an open index? Anyone can kind of create a new torrent and, and attach it to the tracker. Uh, so, we have, uh, uh, in order to, anyone can sign up, uh, but if you want to upload a data set, you either need to have a EDU email address, uh, or we'll have to approve you and say, you have to tell us, like, just that you're an academic in some sort of, um, some sort of context, you know, because uh, it's geared towards uh, specifically helping academics um, uh, share their data. All right, so we've had issues where things are obviously, like, not in line with um, if someone, you know, uploads Mission Impossible to the site, uh, we have to find that and disable it, right? So there, there is curation, uh, light, it's very light. We don't have any, uh, um, problems, I guess, recently, uh, on, on the, the fact that if people upload, uh, kind of, uh, uh things that don't, uh, adhere to, to what, what we think is obviously not legal, um, uh, but generally, uh, the, the curation is, is, is for those blatantly uh, illegal things um, and to kind of, I guess, help people uh, get their data orchestrated with the, with these, the, the system. So sometimes we'll, we'll see people upload data uh, and then we'll, we'll help them properly uh, set it up 
so that they, they don't have any issues with people downloading it. So now this does strike me though, as you know, your, your project gets bigger and more popular and whatnot, you get more uploads, um, things will get more gray um, as opposed to the simple black and whites of like, oh, that's a Hollywood movie, we should not allow that. And uh, oh, this is a charting of stars in the galaxy, we should obviously allow that. How are you forecasting to be able to handle, or is there a, a committee or a council or something like who who decides whether this data is academic and therefore worthy to go here, or uh, this is not academic and we should not host it? Uh, it's it's been pretty clear cut uh, for all the the situations. We have uh, restrictions on on who can kind of put files on the the site, uh, so that that pretty much makes these problems go away. Uh, but we do have a board of directors of the Institute for Reproducible Research, right? So it's me and, and uh, two other um, people. And uh, if anything was, you know, weird or couldn't make the decision, uh, then then we'd kind of uh, have a discussion, have a meeting about this at, at, at a, and figure out our, our trajectory. But we haven't had any issues that... Uh, really made made it a difficult decision. Gotcha. Oh, I, I asked this question in the context of like, you know, some of the more notable data sets that you have there. For example, uh, you know, you have the Hillary Clinton emails uh, data set there. And in, in some ways, that's an incredibly valuable historical record um, and a, a sociological record. There's, there's all kinds of things that you could study with that. But look through another lens, someone might say, well, that's just a political statement. That's not academic work at all. You know, and uh, another one with the Enron emails, you could, you could also make uh, similar claims there. Depending who you are and what your bias are, the issue could be gray. Um, how, how do you handle these things? I mean, you clearly already made the decision on these ones. They are published. They are available uh, mm -hmm. and so on. So how did that go? Uh, well, the Enron email data set is uh, an actual old, uh, well-studied data set in academia, right? So – Kind of a uh, the line between that and the Hillary Clinton emails. Um, if they're if they're public emails, uh, then uh, they they fall in line with with the historically what the Enron email data set has has been. I mean, it's a studied uh, piece of uh, the public record of history, right? So if if there's you know academic interest in it, uh, then then that that qualifies as a as a data set that someone can use the the service for. Okay, so let's talk about quantity now. Um, I guess there's two different numbers. How much data does the tracker um, disseminate in uh, any given year? Um, and then also, how many individual pieces of data are you tracking? All right, so the, the total number, which we keep, uh, it's a live counter on the, the homepage, is a, a 15.75 terabytes as of, as of right now that I'm looking at it. Uh, in total, uh, we have almost served uh, seven, well, we have served, sorry, 798 terabytes uh, over the lifetime of academic torrents. Um, and that keeps going up. So uh, a while ago, uh, the average was about one terabyte uh, a day of, of, of traffic. And now we might be over that 1.5, uh, uh, two, it seems to be um, increasing. So, uh, so this, the, the, the traffic gets gets more and more every day, and it's it's seem a very surprising amount uh, whenever I look at it. Okay, so that's a, a true truckload worth of data there. Um, how do you ever prune any data? Is anything ever expire, or or do you require people to you know once a year re up their data or something to make sure it's not stale and useless anymore? Um, no, so. For keeping the data fresh on academic torrents, because you always need someone hosting this, uh, sometimes people will upload data uh, or they'll, they'll start a seed for a week or so and then they'll just disappear uh, and so does their data. And no one ever wanted to copy it. Um, so and that's kind of a, the, the democratic process of hosting data, which is the, the way that uh, we kind of envision academic torrents as being sustainable forever, right? Is, is that the community will decide which data exists forever. Uh, we have, uh, so there are people, um, we have a lot of volunteers that are uh, 
it seems like they're combing academic torrents, that they're reading the latest uploads, uh, and then they decide whether they're going to put that on their hosting infrastructure or not. Right? So some people you know, have, automa- have this kind of automatic uh, download, uh, but it seems like other people are curating it themselves. And we, kind of, we like that angle. It's up to them. If you're donating bandwidth to academic torrents uh, and storage, you, you make these decisions. We, we don't want you to download everything because right? that, that, that would be too much. Um, so some data sets can be, can be gigantic, and then no one wants to host them. Um, but also, it's not just kind of – not all the data has to be there available for everyone all the time. There's, there's one specific data set uh, that I forget – I think it's – I think the whole data set itself is 7 terabytes or something like that. Uh, and it's only – all the seeds are only turned on uh, when that, that professor wants to share data with someone else. So, you know, I'll watch this. Uh, it seems like uh, there'll be someone that tries to download it, and I'll see that, and I'll be like, oh, oh, that person's not going to get that data, you know, because it's not, uh, there's no seeds. Uh, and then I'll see all the seeds come online, as if that person must have emailed that professor. They turned on all their hosting, and then that data was just transferred over once using, using BitTorrent. Uh, and then all the seeds will shut off again. So it's almost like, you know, this is a, this is a tool that, that they're using, that the, the indices are all there, um, on the site, uh, but it, they might not have to be hosted all the time. You can try to download something and then reach out to the person who uploaded it and say, hey, uh, can, you, can you share your data? And then they'll host it again. Okay, well, so that's a fair point. It, you know, actually, that's pretty fascinating. I've never heard of torrents being used that way. Um, how do I find that? Because you, you said something fascinating in there. You're like, oh, I tried to download it. Um, it wasn't there, so I emailed the professor. Well, how do I a find that data set and b find the owner to contact them? Oh yeah, so specifically that data set was it's probably linked from some paper uh, that that person was reading. Uh, so, but generally, you, you probably wouldn't find that data set in the search because there's no one there's no one seeding it. Uh, so that the search is is a uh, kind of uh, crafted in a specific way that it, it's going to use kind of how popular data sets are to return what's more relevant to what you're searching for. Uh, so when you, when you search academic torrents, uh, what, you're gonna, what you're seeing is a kind of uh, algorithmically curated list of what's available and what's popular. Uh, so that, that helps a kind of these data sets that are kind of no, not seeded or not hosted uh, often are, are kind of pushed down the list. And then the stuff that's popular and probably what you're searching for is going to pop up to the top. So what if I want to use something like Academic Torrents? Um, it sounds like that you know you don't do seeding, but is that something that maybe I could either as a data provider who wants to put data out there, could I actually like pay you, or is there a very easy way to use like one of the cloud providers to um, seed and put data out there that I want to put out there? Uh, so we actually we have. Uh a donated uh, BitTorrent CDN from, from Whatbox. So they've graciously donated a gigantic server uh, that, that we uh, curate uh, what's on it. Um, a lot of other people will just simply donate the, the seeding. Um, so, so for some data sets that kind of uh, we'd like to help people out uh, hosting, uh, we'll just throw it on our CDN uh, as long as we have space for it. Right? So not the ones that are you know, far too big, but the ones that are uh, reasonable size that we can we can help out. Um, that's kind of like how we manage those donations. Um, uh, alternatively, uh, you could you could find an initial hosting location anywhere. So we kind of craft the the, the torrents to to be embedded with a HTTP URL that's that works as a backup. So you can get cheap HTTP hosting from any provider that gives you you know, unlimited storage, right? So it doesn't have to be fast, right? Which is the, the benefit. You can buy cheap, you can buy just a cheap web server somewhere, put your data on there, and it'll be, you know, horribly slow if you downloaded it directly. Um, but then we help, help you embed that cheap hosting into a torrent so that you get the speed advantage uh, with only having to host the data on some really cheap uh, provider. Uh, there's also other... Other places that let you host your data uh, for free. So we have a, we have an integration uh, with Google Drive uh, that when you go to upload, if this file is small enough, and the small is you know thirty megabytes, so it's it's a uh, it's pretty limiting. Um, but 
you can uh, you can upload your data directly through the upload page on Academic Torrents, and it'll actually put your data on Google Drive, and then share it in just the right way, and then embed the URL inside the torrent, uh, and take care of all the magic configuration that we've figured out works. Um, so you can kind of take your data, upload it directly to Academic Torrents, and then that torrent sits on Academic Torrents, and people can download it, and then you don't have to host anything, because Google Drive is storing your data, and then it's being distributed through Academic Torrents. So that's one solution we've, we've, we've figured out. We wanted to kind of extend that to other services, but um, we, we haven't uh, really uh, found any partners that want to take that paid step with us uh, for us to you know, give some paid hosting. Uh, so we just rely on the free, uh, the free Google, Google Drive accounts to, to do that. Uh, you, you said a CDN in there from what box? Uh, can, you, can you define what that is? Uh, so it's uh, people could also call it a seed box, right? So it's a just a server uh, somewhere. I think ours is in the Netherlands uh, that has a really fast internet connection and uh, a bunch of storage, and you can kind of go to some web page and upload uh, uh, the torrent files, and they'll download on that box. So it's just a just a BitTorrent server, you know, located somewhere, uh, but the the, the terminology uh, is CDN because it kind of matches what people think a CDN does, and which was what it does. Right? It, 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 uh, it delivers your content, right? but using BitTorrent. Now, what if I am providing a piece of data? Like, say I'm somebody who not only publishes data, but I'm actually the one who collects it, and it's something that is being updated on a regular basis. Is there a way for me as the original creator to kind of say, oh, sorry, it's slightly different now. Put, you, know, you put out the first new seed and everybody who had the old version gets updated. Is there any concept of versioning here or is it every version is going to be its own seed? Yeah, so generally uh, we like the, the principle that a specific entry uh, dictates a specific set of files you know, and those bits are in a specific order. Uh, but there's this amazing property that, that BitTorrent has where if you, if you downloaded a file once and you have all the data, let's say you have a folder with 100 files in it and you downloaded that via BitTorrent, uh, you can you know, remove the, the torrent file from your torrent client and then the data is sitting on your drive somewhere. Uh, and let's say someone else publishes a new version of that data with just one file changed. You can download that torrent file again and then point your torrent client at the old data, Right? And then it'll, it'll actually look at the hashes and pieces of all those files and find that just one file was changed. And then it would only download that one file that was changed. So that kind of uh, gives us versioning on a very, on a very uh, low level, on a, on a, on a bit level. Um, so it ends up working really well in specific situations. Uh, it's kind of not so friendly to use, but for, for gigantic amounts of data, it's definitely worth it. When you have, when you have 150 gigabytes of data and only uh, one gigabyte changed, uh, it's much easier uh, to go to kind of uh, uh, have your client verify which data you have already downloaded ver versus the new data than, than to download all the new data again. Okay, but this makes it sound like that this is really intended to be a distribution mechanism, not necessarily a storage mechanism. Like if I'm generating all this data, I wouldn't use academic uh, torrents to, to store it and access it and whatnot. I would use that more to say, all right, here's all the data I've generated, and now lots of other people can get that. Am I getting the right sense here? Uh, so I think, uh, I think the way to think about it is it's a tool, right? So you can't really rely on any of the volunteer hosting that exists in the community, right? That's good to make, make uh, your downloads go really fast because it's hosted all over the world. But um, if you're really concerned that you want your data available forever and you'd like it to be easily downloaded, uh, I think this platform is, is perfect for that. And I actually I use it for my research data because it makes moving around and managing this big data uh, easy. So if you want to store some data, you can set up multiple hosting locations all over the world. You can do it for yourself, right? So you don't have to rely on anyone else. You take your data and you put it on one machine and then hook a BitTorrent client up to it and then you know, that data is now hosted. And then you can say that maybe you, you want to 
host it somewhere else. So you set up a server somewhere, uh, run a BitTorrent client, and then you can replicate that data from the original location to that location using BitTorrent. And now you have a redundant copy. And so you, you're controlling both those locations. Uh, so now if one of them goes down, it doesn't matter. You have the second backup location there, uh, and, and it's integrated with all this great you know, uh, file checking capability. So you know that that is a, you know, still a valid source of this data. Uh, so you can set up your own uh, global distribution network for your, own, for your data. So um, if you think about it as a tool in that sense, uh, you can use it to make your data resilient to disaster anywhere. Um, especially if you work with a, with a multiple different research groups and each one of these groups hosts you know, all the important data sets that they care about. Um, if, one, if, one, if one location has a, has a break, you know, where all their server breaks, um, that data exists on, on, you know, in all the other labs on those machines. So there's no need to worry. So uh, you also mentioned um, the Institute for Reproducible Research. Can you give us a little bit more background of your involvement and what that goal is? Yeah, so the, the goal of the Institute for Re- Reproducible Research is uh, to make research more accessible and to empower researchers to kind of uh, move forward in research. Uh, so it's embodied itself in now two projects. So we have we have academictorrents.com, uh, which has, has been, you know, around for a while and serves its, its goal like, very well, uh, but also um, a new project uh, called, called shortscience.org uh, aims to make research papers more accessible, right? So often research papers are confusing, uh, so it's hard to understand what the significance of that paper was and kind of evaluate it and think about it. Um, so a lot of times people will make blog posts about research papers and uh, and that kind of explains what the contribution to the scientific community of the paper was, right? Um, otherwise, you'd have to talk to some leader in some field, and that they, you know, they they'd know what the seminal work of that field was, right? But as a new researcher, it's hard to get a feel for what research is is uh, is important and how to understand it, because uh, papers, research papers, can be confusing. Uh, and there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on, so it's hard to it's hard to know uh, what the takeaways from a paper should be, and if you really got them all, right? If you truly understand that paper or that research, uh, so uh, so short science is kind of like a, a journal club for the world, right? So you can um, look up any paper that exists. We tie into tons of databases, uh, and then for that paper, you can see summaries that people have written, right? So currently, we have about 300 summaries. Um, that allows people to kind of get into a specific field uh, much easier. <clears throat> so right now it's kind of really targeted towards machine learning uh, because uh, the people who are, who are currently using this are all in machine learning. Um, and then because, because there are people using machine learning, more people use it uh, to study machine learning, and it's kind of growing in the machine learning field. Um, but so that's, that's kind of a, a, another arm of making research more reproducible by making it more easier to understand, right? Uh, but not, not for just, you know, the general public, but actually for other researchers. You know, research comes out a month ago. What's so crazy about it? Why are people, why do people keep talking about this paper? Um, you can try to, you can read it. Maybe it's a little, you know, the, the, the nomenclature is difficult. Um, but so we have this uh, kind of, we have two arms uh, that are making research more reproducible, by making it easier to get data sets, to, like, to do those experiments again, uh, and then to make it easier to understand research papers. So how do you sustain all of this? Where do you get the resources and the funding for the servers and the people and the time and uh, all these kinds of things? Uh, so for... A while, and still to, to this day, uh, uh, it's mostly uh, based on my contributions to this to this project. Uh, uh, I've I've been working for a long time, uh, so I, you know, in, in the uh, the costs uh, were really kind of they're really kind of low for the, the the there's a lot of engineering work that would cost a lot of money that's just donated, um, but the actual server infrastructure, uh, the way we organize everything, makes it very cheap. Um, especially where we don't host data, right? So we have, we, we kind of make 
15 terabytes available, but uh, we don't host we don't host that data. We just host the index of it. Uh, so the the overhead costs are low, which makes it very easy to sustain this through just our own funds. Uh, we've had donations uh, from from people, but it doesn't actually doesn't cover the costs. But that's not you know that's not too significant. Uh, we recently uh, gained nonprofit status, so we've had an application going for a while now. Uh, and about a few weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, we officially became uh, nonprofit. So now that opens up a whole realm of grants for us to apply f- apply to. Um, so I think that's a route we're going to take, uh, although um, kind of uh, the founders have been uh, distracted uh, by uh, other things to devote a lot of time in writing grants. Right? As long as the system's working um, and it's minimal, minimal cost, uh, it's going to be able to sustain it. We're going to be able to sustain it. Um, it would be great you know, to focus on grant funding for the future uh, to kind of uh, have more impact. In the, in the field and, and maybe make it easier, maybe host more data, maybe have better integrations with, with universities and labs. Um, but that's kind of, uh, we've been uh, gearing up to uh, move more, move in that direction. Uh, but the costs are, are not so bad. So it's, uh, um, it's not terribly uh, inconvenient to, to run this thing. So you mentioned uh, integration um, with universities. What about integration with software? So um, there's like uh, DOIs. Is mm-hmm. do any of the common tools out there like Hydra Fedora or others have the ability to have a DOI point to a torrent living on academic torrents for like say a supporting data set? Uh, so this was one of the initial questions. Um, <clears throat> We got when we launched the site. Uh, <clears throat> so, DOIs are. I looked into it, and they're actually they're expensive. So, and with with almost no money, we just we didn't even deal with getting them for every torrent. Um, and we we have info hashes, so that kind of replaces the need for a DOI. It's like a cryptographic DOI, right? This for for that info hash, it identifies that exact piece of data perfectly. So there's, there's, we, we didn't really need to go through that. People have actually put these info hashes in their research papers to signify which data um, to point to on academic torrents. Um, so it hasn't really been uh, a need. Um, we, we integrated a little bit with, with some software. So a while ago, we released uh, this, this utility called AT Down. So it's specifically a downloader that's meant to run on high-performance computers. So it's, it's written in pure Java, which allows it to not require any special packages that would need to be compiled on a high-performance computer. So you probably can't email your uh, system admin and say, I'd like you to install libtorrent so I can download uh, BitTorrent on, on your cluster. Uh, but the, it probably already has a module for Java. So that was kind of the, the goal to make it easier. Um, and because at the time I needed it to download aerial images on a cluster. So um, we worked on a pure Java BitTorrent client that kind of is integrated to academic torrents. You can type in uh, an info hash and it'll go look up on academic torrents for that info hash and download that file right into the directory on your your cluster or wherever you are. Um, and it also downloads collections of files. So we have, a, we have an interesting collections inf- uh, kind of um, system on academic torrents. So Files or torrents can be grouped into collections. So you can have a collection for deep learning uh, or a collection for ImageNet. Right? So if you just want to download all the ImageNet data, even though it's contained in multiple torrents, you can just download the entire collection. Uh, and this actually helps out um, for people mirroring data. If, they, if, they, if you have some BitTorrent client and you'd like to mirror all the data uh, that it relates to deep learning or, or computer vision or all the course uh, video lectures that are on academic torrents. There's a collection for each one of these, and then you can download an RSS feed for each one of those and download it with whatever client uh, you want to. Um, so a, we've kind of we've worked to make it easier to deal with software uh, to kind of integrate with uh, other software that exists by by either making it kind of match other pieces of software or to write our own like like uh, AT down. Uh, and then in the future, um, we're actually uh, I'm starting to work on this with a graduate software engineering course uh, of, of students. 
we want to integrate academic torrent downloading into languages like Python or R. So a lot of the times when you go look at some code example, like a, uh, a neural network that's going to classify every, you know, the 10 labels of SIPAR10, and they're demoing some network with some tool. The first line of these you know, software demos, because right, this might be a little Python script, it goes and fetches the data and like, you know, unzips it into folders and, and, and then checks whether it's there or not so it doesn't re-download it. Uh, and then it goes on to actually do the, you know, the scientific piece, which is like showing how this network works. Uh, but for uh, this new utility, we could easily have it say, you know, uh, just get this file and it'll, easy, it'll take care of downloading it, verifying that it's the correct file. And, and if it has already been downloaded, uh, whether the correct data is still there and if it's missing any. So it, it makes reproducible research even easier. Um, and kind of making, kind of fitting into the life cycle of a person demoing code on a seminal data set uh, and making sure that that data that they were using is available forever. Um, or for the, you know, if it's popular and used by these, uh, by these users who are trying to distribute their, their code. Because oftentimes they'll put it on some web server that's run by the university and then when they leave, they you know uh, get rid of their account, and now that data is gone, and that that source code demo can never work again. Uh, but if it was a popular uh, piece of code and people had mirrored that data, uh, it would still be available. You know, the original code that they published with their paper would still work if they had been using this this new tool we want to develop, which is the you know a uh, a Python and R uh, package uh, for academic turns. All right, so uh, what is the most surprising or unanticipated use of academic torrents that you've uh, seen? One of the cool things that we get to talk about with our guests on this show is that they design some cool piece of technology and make it available to people. And then the amazing creativity of the human race finds surprising and unanticipated uses for that technology. What, what have you seen with that in academic torrents? Oh, uh, I didn't. I haven't thought about that. Um, so we did not expect course videos, course lecture videos, to be as popular as they are. Uh, so that's kind of sprung out of this. Uh, uh, and then it makes sense um, if you're on a plane and you want to watch a video, or if you're on a, you know, if you're traveling and you you want to uh, watch some set of course lectures uh, that you might not have a good fast internet connection. So it makes sense for you to just download uh, the, the entire class uh, with all the videos uh, to your laptop. So that's the one that comes to mind. Uh, I'm sure there are, there are other ones. Okay, yeah, so there's another one. Uh, so somebody uploaded uh, all the images from a museum. So there's a museum and they, they had an API where you could, uh, you could view their collections online. But they had to use their website and, and do all this stuff. So someone wrote a scraper. They scraped all this public image data into a folder and shared it uh, on Academic Torrents. Uh, to me, that kind of – I thought it was really neat because that museum's collection was now globally distributed. Uh, so everyone could you know, kind of uh, experience that museum. And that was kind of immortalized in a torrent file that, that was full of – all the images from the collections of that museum. Um, so that, that kind of that kind of inspired me in a way to think like this is this is a uh, this is taking this this data uh, and making it so much more accessible to to everyone. So how can someone contribute to academic torrents either via development or data sets? So I think the the biggest contribution would be putting data sets on academic torrents and kind of. Uh, integrating that with uh, the way that that research is done in that in that area, um, and bringing that into the life cycle of how you do research with data, I think that's that's the that's the the most um, useful way. Um, a lot of people also choose to donate bandwidth uh, by hosting the data sets that they uh, like and want to. Uh, share right, so we make this easy with collections, right? So you can just subscribe to a collection that's curated by someone else, uh, and it will, you know, th then your your BitTorrent client will just automatically download all the the new things that are uploaded in, into that collection. 
Um, and I think that's 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 a pre- kind of preferred way of donating uh, bandwidth and storage to us because uh, it puts you in control. That's we're all about you know democratizing uh, how the site's used. Uh, we are a nonprofit, uh, so you know donating money is definitely uh, a thing um, that uh, that you can now write off on your on your taxes as a charitable donation. Um, for code, uh, the projects in the past we have a GitHub repo with a lot of projects uh, that people worked on uh, that have a lot of bugs uh, that are totally undocumented. So there's a lot of there's a lot of code there. So if you if you emailed us and said you know what your specialty is, uh, right now we're looking at making uh, interfaces for Python and R. So if you are interested in that, we would love for you to um, work on that uh, with us. Uh, and the graduate students that that should be joining us uh, later this semester or next semester. Um, so, and so that that's that's the area there. We also have a desktop a desktop client that we worked on a tiny amount. There's a lot of different started projects um, that we'd love to talk to people about where their specialty is uh, and kind of uh, wherever they dream BitTorrent could be in research. We're willing to talk about it and how it, that can integrate. Um, so, so on the code side, we're open to, to uh, working with people on all, on all these things and take a look at our, our GitHub. Uh, and, uh, um, but the biggest thing is putting data on the site. That's, that's the, most, um, the most important thing, making this data available to be mirrored globally. Right? So once you put a data set up, uh, the community will decide, uh, you know, whether it wants to mirror it. And usually, when a data set, when people want to mirror a data set, you know, it's it's hosted at at least thirty locations uh, globally. So, um, that is the that is the best thing to do. Okay, Joseph, thank you very much for your time. You can find Academic Torrent at academictorrent dot com. Uh, and once again, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me.